Okay, I think we will start now and I uh, would love to welcome you back uh, from the lunch break and uh, we will start now with panel two. I'm very happy you rejoined and um, as we build up on our panel's insight, it's important to highlight the global context of uh, our discussion of panel number two. In the previous panel, we've had the privilege of hearing from organizations like the OECD and ILO who have emphasized the need for comprehensive strategies to address needs on a global scale, spanning both northern and southern regions. Their valuable insights set the stage for our discussions today. So I'm very happy to welcome you to this discussion on preventing need status through a holistic approach. This multi-phase challenge extends beyond traditional employment services, requiring a comprehensive approach that actively engages at risk youth and addresses underlying social and educational barriers. This panel features experts with unique perspective. Our keynote speaker, Ms. Christina Miroita, Senior Human Capital Development Expert and Coordinator for Active Labour Market Policies at the European Training Foundation, will focus on prevention, outreach and skills development, particularly in the Western Balkans. Mrs. Christina Fleischer, Head of Job Seekers Division at the Central Office of the Croatian Public Employment Agency, will share her insights on addressing need status in Croatia. Ms. Anseline Adnet, Manager of Communication, Customer Feedback and Contact Center, representing the Belgian PES Le Forum. She will discuss their program, Coup de Boost for Need Prevention. We will also have a short video on behalf of the Estonian Public Employment Service who unfortunately couldn't join us in person and following that we'll engage in a round table discussion as we have learned already this morning um, in our first panel and uh, I want to thank you all for being part of this essential conversation and I look forward to a productive and engaging discussion. Now without further ado I want to introduce Mrs. Christina Meroita. She's a senior human capital developer development expert and coordinator for active labor market policies at the European Training Foundation. Christina's responsibilities span the coordination of ETF projects, advising EU neighboring countries on youth guarantee inspired schemes, conducting research on skills, anticipation and matching, and contributing to the EU policy dialogue in employment services and skills development. Her extensive experience, including her previous role at the Ministry of Labour and Social Protection of Romania, positions her as a valuable resource in our discussion on active labour market policies and on youth employment. Christina, I will welcome you here to the stage and uh, we are very eagerly anticipating your presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome back after the uh, lunch break. I know that it must be difficult to, to take up now and to uh, also show a couple of uh, graphs. So I hope that, uh, yeah, I will try to keep it short and uh, just to, to recap the key elements of uh, um, uh, dealing and uh, finding the right policy mix for addressing this uh, big challenge of uh, uh, young people not in um, uh, employment education or, uh, or uh, training. Uh, before um, yeah, starting the presentation, I just once again want to, I'm grateful to, you know, for this opportunity to share our uh, experience. European Training Foundation is the agency of the European Union working with EU neighboring uh, countries and Central Asia uh, countries and we focus very much on human capital uh, capital development. So I'm grateful for the in invitation to uh, um, uh, the public employment uh, service of uh, Turkey and also Azerbaijan and of course to colleagues from, from WAPES for this invite. Um, we will bring in the aspect of skills uh, when it comes to, to need, dealing with the uh, need and the transition from, from school to work and uh, before 
yeah, uh, going into the issues, I just maybe want to share with you our, let's say, conceptual framework in uh, at ETF. Uh, when we look at the uh, transition, youth transition from, from school to work, and maybe to reconfirm what has been said this morning uh, already. It's a complex policy uh, intervention. It covers multiple sectors and policy uh, areas, not only employment, of course, education, but uh, from the experience we had and uh, from uh, other countries like the European Union, we noticed that also, for example, housing policies or social protection or um, um, availability of uh, you know, additional support services for the most vulnerable are critical to secure uh, a smooth transition from, from school to work. So uh, we look here and when we start working, have started working on, uh, on this, um, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, addressing the, the challenge of, of need, uh, we recognize these long-term consequences of education attainment, the type of education uh, uh, attainment and also the labor market attachment. You'll see later on and you know already from your experience that there is a strict clear correlation between education and employability and employment uh, uh, probability. Then um, of course over the last 10 years maybe from 2008 you know from, from the crisis of 2008 but for certain countries even before we, knew, we know exactly what it means a crisis, what, how disruptive it is, how long long term it is as well in terms of impact and nowadays unfortunately the let's say uh, um, the situation across the world as well it's rather a, a crisis a lot of threats from security point of view as well and um, uh, this impacts particularly younger so children and uh, younger uh, younger population uh, so we deal with a lot of disruptions and most worrying for us as uh, you know working on policies and so on is also that it's rather difficult to capture, to, to understand exactly the impact and so on. Yeah? So, um, and then, um, of course, what, we, um, what is important is also to have detailed information on labor market situation of young people. Not only one indicator, two indicators, or five indicators. We really need to know exactly who is unemployed uh, uh, or inactive, what are the reasons, uh, or so many many uh, additional insights that come from statistical offices but also come from uh, uh, additional type of research, yeah? focus groups and so on. Uh, it is important to hear the voice of young people, that's also uh, a lesson for us um, and then uh, uh, of course to look at all policies uh, levels that are influencing the transition from school to work. Maybe I forgot to say the ETF, uh, so here you have the countries that uh, our geographical mandate. Uh, so we work with countries from Southeast uh, Europe, Turkey, Middle East, Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia. Uh, but on, upon request, we provide our advice also beyond this. But I think uh, with this graph, I just want to warn everyone that aging and uh, the, 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 the challenge of uh, 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 aging demographics is everywhere. Yeah, uh, As you see from, from these countries, from our countries, let's say the geopartner countries, only few still enjoy a window of opportunity when it comes to younger cohorts. In general, all this reddish part shows this um, aging uh, uh, pattern. Uh, here I included few elements and few numbers regarding the incidence of uh, uh, need in our, uh, in our uh, uh, countries and it reconfirms the uh, higher exposure to this risk among uh, young um, uh, girls, young, uh, young women and uh, finally maybe to showcase again and what I said the relationship between education, level of education and employment uh, probability here the, num the, the figure, the, the indicator looks at the whole um, workforce uh, that is you know, employed, 15 plus, but it uh, it's more or less correlates also with what is happening for, um, for uh, younger, uh, younger cohorts. Um, so the starting point here, we, I wanted to share you now something that it's rather a, a well-known secret somehow when it comes to uh, youth guarantee uh, pr uh, promoting these positive transitions from, from school to work and I want you to draw the attention to this greyish uh, part 
which is about young people, 15 to 29, that are combining school studies and work. As you see in the EU countries, the average is around uh, 15%. Uh, for the other countries for which we have data, unfortunately this is an issue, um, uh, not all countries apply uh, fully the labor force survey. This is a labor force survey <coughs> data. So there are particular questions that should be added to the survey to have such data. So for the countries that for which we had data, um, you can see that the number, you know, that part, that it's quite low. So um, ETF always advises, our advice is, you know, try to um, uh, equip students, pupils, yeah, learners with practical skills because this is an important element. Uh, give them a chance to also work during studies, particularly university students and so on. So, <coughs> sorry, the numbers somehow reconfirm this. Uh, another point it's about yeah to continue this argument on work-based learning value. Um, again, um, a recent data. Uh, I'm, fi I'm very glad that finally the st of traditional statistical uh, uh, surveys are producing this kind of uh, uh, data. Here you have an, an inf information about the apprenticeships, which have to be remunerated, curriculum, re uh, cu curriculum related, uh, should last at least six months. This is an important quality ele element of youth guarantee uh, in the European Union and also in the Western Balkans. So you can see that, for example, in certain countries, the proportion of um, uh, young um, uh, vet graduates aged 15 to 34, uh, it's higher or lower, and it, again, it might be an explanatory for uh, uh, higher need, uh, need rates. Turkey performs, Turkey performs quite uh, uh, well on that uh, in terms of work-based learning uh, opportunities um, and also relatively on apprenticeships. Uh, the best is uh, Switzerland. Then, uh, I would, uh, it would have been impossible for me to have this presentation without the work and the commitment of uh, our colleagues from Western Balkan um, uh, economies. Um, in 2021, if I remember well, yes, uh, Western Balkans adopted um, uh, uh, an an ambitious political commitment to develop youth guarantee implementation plans inspired from the experience of the European uh, uh, Union. And uh, with that, the European Commission, uh, the International Labour Organization, and also ETF supporting the EU community, we also uh, devised um, a technical assistance and additional uh, support for our uh, partner countries from the Western uh, Balkans, but also so uh, we try to retarget the EPA uh, uh, investment. EPA is a scheme to, to, to support. It's like in Euro, Europe is the Europe, European Social Fund. In terms of objectives, they are, they are right, uh, rather similar. So we, we try to, to support the countries. But the bottom line is that actually the, the countries have committed for that. And it's an ambitious uh, uh, reform package uh, that requires stronger collaboration uh, between, you know, among schools, universities, uh, research institutes as well, uh, of course, public employment services, and most importantly, social, social services as well. Uh, we know already, and you know already, colleagues from the Western Balkans, that the implementation of such a reform requires deep reforms, and act not maybe a redesign of certain active labor market programs, but it requires also additional resources for public employment services, particularly staffing, staff, yeah, dealing with and working with uh, 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 young need uh, and uh, financial financial resources um, so um, yeah it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite uh, it's a it's a difficult road and path uh, ahead but I, th I think we will be uh, you will be successful also since we also all the donors and other uh, other um, yeah let's say support uh, agencies have committed to to, to provide this support. Overall, what we see in terms of transition patterns, uh, and this is what we found out after you know this work with the Western Balkans, and not only, is that outreaching and counselling are critical for uh, implementation of 
uh, a strong uh, need policy uh, approach and also skills uh, since uh, unfortunately I mean there is an accelerated labor uh, market change with a lot of disruptions the classical education and training systems cannot keep up it's impossible so for this reason we also argue for a lifelong learning lifelong learning strong and real lifelong learning uh, uh, opportunities yeah so with opportunities to change and to learn again uh, and on a regular basis another point is about the career counseling and i think this morning one of uh, the speaker i, I think the uh, waves president mentioned this mental part uh, mental psychological support that young people need and this is also our point uh, uh, our young people current generation of young people uh, we need to take into account that they also suffered a lot during pandemic so we are dealing now with graduates that have have mostly followed online uh, courses for one year or two years. They, the, there are education losses not yet fully accounted for. Uh, but also we live through all these difficulties, you know, crisis uh, and so on. So our point when it comes to career counseling and outreaching and so on is that we also have to add this element of coaching, of uh, psychological support and so on. And to make this shift and I think his, this table expresses, I hope, quite clear, from a classical career guidance objective that would be motivational training, would be uh, activation, would be, you know, registration of uh, uh, need and uh, uh, trying to teach them how to write a CV and so on, to move from that and to add this element of empowering young people yeah and here is again the point of having enough staff and counselors and specialized staff to do uh, this work for a sustainable activation and empowerment of uh, of young people uh, and the last point, I'm not going to insist because it's rather technical, but I really want to make this point because uh, I know that colleagues from Western Balkan, uh, uh, Balkans, they found it quite difficult. And also in the European Union, uh, there were a lot of difficulties when it comes to quality of offers uh, under the Youth Guarantee. You, I, I'm sure that you, you know very well the quality of offer under the Youth Guarantee is, uh, is a must. Yeah, it's a con clear condition. It should be decent employment, matched employment, so an employment opportunity that matches the education uh, of the respective uh, uh, young person. Uh, the second, any apprenticeship, traineeship, or continued education that is over offered under uh, uh, youth guarantee has to be quality assured. Uh, just to, it's a reminder, uh, you, you are fully aware of that, there is a European uh, quality framework for apprenticeship with clear criteria and conditions that should be fulfilled. The same for traineeship, again, clear criteria to avoid abuse, cheap labor, and, and so on. Uh, and also when it comes to training offers, additional further training offers, those should be linked to national qualification framework of a country if in place. Finally, we also noticed, and this is something that we, we let's say, preach, if I can say, at, at the EU level also, all of us, we are fully aware of flexible learning, uh, labor markets, yeah, for remote work, and we had examples this morning. Equally, there is a trend of learning flexibilization. Now, learning is happening in traditional formats, but also in non-formal and informal uh, context. So all countries should have mechanism to recognize and validate these skills. And for this reason, I want also want, wanted to mention this. As you see here, it's an example of validation process. So I stop here. I thank you very much for the attention, and I hope also the presentation provides you further, if, you know, uh, sources for, you know, reforms and, uh, uh, you know, technical support for your, um, for your work. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Christina, for your speech uh, and the enlightenment. Uh, it was really great to have a, a broader overview. And um, you will all have the opportunity um, to have uh, some questions, as we did in the previous panel. Please like, write them down, and uh, you will be able also to ask Christina from the European Training Foundation some questions later. Well, now I would like to go ahead and uh, present our next speaker uh, from the Croatian Public Employment Service, Mrs. Christina. Fleischer. She serves as the head of the Job Seekers Division in the Central Office of the Croatian Employment Service, a role she held since 2012. Her career is dedicated to implementing and enhancing client-centric methods and services, focusing on mutual satisfaction for both job seekers and employers. In 2015, she was nominated as an internal and external assessor for the bench learning process, specializing in areas like profiling, youth guarantee, blended services, client satisfaction, and standardizing business processes. With a background in political science from the unit University of Zagreb, she initially worked as a business report analyst in the private sector before joining the Croatian Employment Service, where she's made a significant contributions over the last 10 years. <laughs> so Christina, I welcome you to the stage uh, to speak on behalf of the Croatian Public Employment Service. Well, thank you, Nicole. Uh, at the beginning, I would really like to thank uh, 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 Turkey uh, Employment Agency as well as uh, Azerbaijan uh, Employment Agency as well as WAPES for inviting me here to be able to present uh, our practice regarding the needs. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I was just briefly go through uh, through the uh, basic labor data uh, on the in, in the Croatia. In Croatia, as you can see, Croatia is a, a Central European country. It is a really small country. So when I talk about the numbers, it would be really insignificant comparing to other uh, uh, to other countries. Uh, but mostly, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the uh, youth unemployment rate. Uh, maybe just one point uh, to uh, say at the beginning. Uh, when the youth unemployment or recommendation uh, started in the European Union, uh, and it took it, uh, it was meant for. Uh, youth between 15 and 24. Uh, in the Croatia, uh, at the ministry level, uh, we all decided from the beginning that we are not going to uh, only include uh, youth up till 25, but up till 30 years. So when I talk about uh, youth unemployment, I always talk the age group 15 to 29, uh, because from the beginning there are all focal points. Focal point. Uh, as you can see, uh, the number of unemployed uh, is really low now. But when we started with the, the issue, dealing with the issue of youth, the overall unemployment was around 400,000 uh, uh, people. It, it was around 23%. It was very, very high. Now you can see it is around 6%. Uh, and when we talk about youth, uh, now uh, youth unemployment, but only unemployment, not, not the need rate, uh, is around 24%. Uh, and it used to be 50%. So in this decade of dealing with uh, young people, I have to say that we progressed uh, somewhat uh, into the into more uh, flexible labor market, but as well uh, uh, a more opportune uh, labor market for young people. Uh, I also put here uh, the map of uh, Croatian Employment Service since we are the main actor uh, dealing with uh, uh, youth or youth unemployment. Uh, and we want to say, uh, I want to add that although we are a very small country, we have a lot of small offices that we bring uh, our services to 99 uh, local offices. So basically every person uh, or unemployed person or interested 
youth uh, can have their services uh, uh, gotten by us in the uh, throughout throughout Croatia. Uh, I would just like to talk about a little bit about the preventing measures. Uh, we very much focus on preventing uh, or early interventions for uh, for youth, uh, and it is it was the focal point from the beginning. And when I talk about early interventions, I'm not talking about early interventions when the, the young people are unemployed, but when they are still at school. So uh, we have a career guidance center, uh, which are which was actually they were uh, they they are doing the same uh, type of service not the same type since 1931 so there is a long time uh, experience in working with career guidance uh, and that experience we put up uh, uh, to deal with uh, young people especially uh, preventing uh, early school uh, early school living and uh, preventing um, uh, and adding education on uh, adding education. So uh, at the at the moment, uh, when we talk about youth, around 65 up to 70 percent has at least vocational or upper secondary education. So it is a very huge number compared to some other countries, and it is it is thank, uh, thanks to the Career Guidance Center throughout Croatia because they are uh, they have a partnership agreements with schools when they come to the schools and have career guidance, especially with the pupils and students at the at the end of their uh, that part of education, so they can choose the most perfect uh, uh, further education, whether it is a vacation, a vocational education or upper secondary or tertiary education. Uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, youth, uh, we talked about how can we make a uh, one-stop shop service. It is not a one-stop shop service, but one-stop shop uh, uh, dealing with uh, all the services from uh, employment, public employment service. So there, there was a lifelong career guidance centers was established in 2013, CISOC uh, Center, uh, which deals with mostly youth. Of course, uh, everybody is welcome to get the. Um, services there but mostly they are uh, they are dealing with youth in the schools uh, they also have a partnership agreement and one other thing they are uh, responsible for uh, for is outreach to inactive needs it is the most difficult task of all tasks they have to do because we don't know what, uh, where those inactive needs are so you have to search them uh, in 2015 we had a larger project with other uh, governmental institutions where we uh, combined uh, different databases uh, to see where those uh, inactive uh, needs are uh, so that we can plan activities in these areas more uh, that we know who they are, not, not personally, but uh, uh, the, the uh, overall who they are, what kind of education they have, where they are living, and so on, so that you can uh, act uh, or you can propose different services uh, for different uh, areas uh, in, in the country. Uh, one other thing that we are doing very well, and it is doing, it, we are doing it for more than 10 years now, it is it is uh, enrollment uh, uh, policy. Uh, actually, we do uh, we give the recommendation on the national and on the local level uh, for the enrollment in the uh, secondary education or a tertiary education based on the labor mark uh, analysis. So, if we see that in one area there are quite a lot of one occupations that they don't need to have more students in the next one or two or three years for that occupation, we do give that a recommendation. 
Unfortunately, uh, those recommendations need to be uh, implemented by schools, uh, which are the other ministry, and uh, when we talk about uh, uh, collaboration with ministry, they are, they are not very keen of especially reducing the number of, uh, the number of pupils they are going to enroll for uh, one or the other occupation. But uh, as the situation has changed, uh, not only on the labor market, but also in the population of youth, uh, in the recent uh, research, uh, it is shown that uh, in Croatia, uh, over 100,000 uh, youth are no longer youths. So the, uh, the pool of youth is uh, reduced by 100,000. It is quite a lot for, for, for a small country. So uh, basically we have to work more on uh, upskilling, reskilling, uh, trainings and education for the, especially for the shortage occupation. Uh, the services uh, that we provide in e-guidance uh, are uh, in uh, career guidance are uh, available all, also online uh, with uh, with uh, uh, e-tools like my choice or e-guidance uh, that everybody uh, can fulfill the questionnaire and get the results. Those those. Um, results are changed based on on the on the data every several years it is not a, a large uh, sample so you have you we cannot change it uh, on a yearly basis but uh, it is being changed and uh, another occupation uh, can be chosen and this this part is mostly focused on children or pupils or uh, youth before becoming needs or before becoming unemployed. While when they become unemployed, this is just briefly one uh, uh, customer journey, when they uh, become unemployed, they, have, they don't need to register, but they usually do. It is customary in, in Croatia that when you don't have a job, you go and register with the unemployment service. I don't know why is that, but it is, I would say, a legacy from, from a previous period that everybody came. So uh, at the beginning, we didn't have any problem with uh, outreaching inactive. So they were all in our databases. So all youth were in our, our databases, so we can work uh, with the, uh, young people. Uh, when they register, they go through counseling. Uh, we do provide a holistic profiling. One thing that we developed years ago, uh, it was in 2017, uh, we, uh, we introduced uh, statistically assisted profiling, uh, which helped us uh, very much in the period of COVID when people couldn't come uh, or it was a distance counseling, it was uh, be mostly or phone counseling and it, it is not the same. So the statistical um, profiling help counselors to focus on the topics of each person much more uh, to provide them, I would say, uh, 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 customer oriented service. So one person could only uh, be sent to jobs, uh, the other to the trainings, or, or some light, uh, light uh, uh, workshops, uh, or something like that. Uh, after the uh, counseling, there is, there is a possibility of individual counseling, but after a while, if a person is still unemployed, after uh, six months, which is uh, uh, at that point out of uh, youth guarantee uh, as the recommendation of uh, European Commission says, then we go through career guidance again. So we have to pull up as much as information from that person to provide them with appropriate, appropriate either training or, or, uh, or a job. Uh, since the youth are a uh, very heterogeneous group, at 
the beginning, uh, with, when we started in 2013 with the youth guarantee, we uh, pointed several different subgroups that were important for us. One group were, uh, were people with disability. Uh, one other uh, subgroup were uh, foster children. We found out they, uh, only, they don't need only our support. Actually, our support is the last one they need. They need a life support. So we have a, a cooperation and we a partnership with the um, NGOs dealing with uh, those children because if they are institutionalized, they don't have a clue about uh, the real life, uh, what is going on. Uh, then, very much, and we focused very much on the youth without work experience. Uh, at that time, around 65% of all uh, youth unemployed were without any any kind of work experience. And our focus at that time was to create an uh, active labor market measure to provide them with the first uh, first work experience. We have to uh, think about that it was 2013, 14, 15. Uh, we have, uh, we didn't have any uh, enough jobs to offer them and the jobs they were off uh, they were uh, uh, on the market were for the people with experience so we actually designed a special measure just for youth uh, for to provide them necessary one year work experience and if the those uh, occupations uh, needed to have uh, some sort of uh, um, uh, masters uh, um, uh, per permit or something like that, they can uh, take up the exam, uh, the additional exam. At that period, around 60,000 uh, people in the period of five years went through that measure. Uh, the measure was not very popular, but it did have effects. Nowadays, when the situation on the labor market is completely different, that measure wouldn't work because they, they, they were compensated, but not, uh, not enough. So then we had to change that uh, type of measure, but there, we had pretty good results that 65% of those 60,000 people who went into that measure uh, were employed after six months of uh, ending that, uh, ending that, uh, we call it um, occupational training uh, um, program. One thing, uh, and we now added another group as one of uh, of the groups that we are uh, focusing on, uh, and those are the long-term unemployed youth. Now. Uh, at this moment, when I talk about, we have around 24,000 registered unemployed uh, youth. It is not a large number, but 40% of those youth are long-term and very long-term unemployed. Uh, now and now we started with the different uh, with the different programs. We call it activation programs, and recently we started with uh, with another uh, sub program. It's a job plus program, which combines motivational counseling, um, upskilling, and gaining work experience. It's overall it is very costly program, but uh, since uh, since we started a year and a half ago, now we have uh, seen first results and they are for the moment they are very positive we'll see after uh, after the sample is much larger uh, uh, in which direction we will go and here I would just briefly go through through uh, uh, measures that we are providing uh, we uh, when I talk we it's the employment Croatian employment service uh, now the focus is not on the uh, not on the subsidies it is for a uh, focus is put on skilling reskilling upskilling uh, of youth and uh, last year we started with the new uh, program uh, voucher program uh, for green and digital jobs Jobs, and I have to. Uh, I'm satisfied with the results that the, uh, around 64% uh, of uh, people went, uh, who went to that programs are needs. So, 
very large number. They are very interested, especially in digital trainings and education. Uh, and I hope that uh, the same the same will stay for the green jobs uh, as well. Uh, and we are adding every day, we are adding new programs uh, uh, on the list and we see that uh, more and more people are going into those programs. Those are the new uh, voucher program uh, and the standard program that we have workplace training. Uh, uh, it is a program that is combined with uh, training, uh, uh, with the mentoring and uh, upskilling uh, and it is one of the part of that program plus mostly for the long-term unemployed. And in the last slide, I'm just going through uh, through it. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, indicators, uh, Eurostat indicators on on youth. Uh, so I just compared uh, compared uh, 2013 and two, uh, 2022. Uh, Early school leavers, we never had problems with early school leavers. Now it's even lower, uh, the percentage is even lower. Uh, but what we do have a, a problem is and then we have to focus on the tertiary education for this indicator uh, between 30, uh, 30 and 34 people in tertiary education. Uh, uh, it's been rising but not, not enough. Uh, so this is everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina, for presenting also on behalf of the Croatian Public Employment Services uh, for young people and the programs uh, that you have installed within your public employment agency. Um, I would like now um, to welcome also our next speaker, Anne-Céline Adnet uh, from the Belgian Public Employment Service Le Forem. She's a manager of communication, customer feedback and contact center contact center. And Celine is convinced by the power of customer listening, reporting, analysis and collective intelligence. And Celine Adnet has one motto in her professional and private life. There is no problem, there are only solutions. During the first 12 years of her career with her degree in communication, she put her sense of organization, pragmatism and creativity at the service at the international energy company Engie. Looking for new challenges and driven by the importance of the public service, she decided to join the Belgian PES Leforem as communication manager 10 years ago. On top of coordinating all the dimensions of communication, internal, external, digital and change management, she makes sure the voice of the customer is taken into account with the collect of customer feedbacks. She also uses her results-oriented, positive and unifying mind to run the contact center. And Celine it's a pleasure for us to have you here and I welcome you here at the stage. Bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes. Switcher les traductions. You have to change uh, your the presentation is in English, but I will speak French. I would like to share the experience of our uh, Belgian uh, colleagues about the Coot Boost, the project we created some years ago. So, of course, uh, you have heard the description. What is uh, the voice of the user of the customer in order to explain you the method, the objectives, the target groups, the results, and so forth. I would like to tell you two stories because we spoke a lot about a lot of concepts, very rich, but you shouldn't forget that all these concepts are made by people, by people searching jobs. We are going to call them Pierre and Marie. Pierre and Marie are uh, those uh, uh, needs, uh, but 
that they are spe uh, specially Pierre and Marie with their background, with their story, and with their perspective, because they could take benefit from that uh, center, could boost. Who is Pierre? It was clear in his mind he wanted uh, to be a military. He didn't change his project. He wanted to work as a military. He finished his studies very young. He didn't like school very much, and somebody told me, you are not going to become a military person. You have a health problem. Pierre was completely demotivated. He had been deceived a deception, and after that another deception, and so forth. So Pierre is now what we call a category of needs in our country. Marie, you know, another story. I would like to uh, tell you that she was a perfect girl. So when the parents asked her to do something, they did. She went to school, she succeeded. Uh, they told her to do this, to do that. She did everything, but she didn't make choices, Marie, because all the choices had been made by her family environment. And then they told her, you have to become a nurse. This was an evidence, but Marie said, I don't want to become a nurse, but Marie is doing what she has been told. So she started those studies, but she abandoned six months later again another decision. Uh, she was deceived again, and uh, Marie, uh, at the end, uh, fell in the category of needs. But uh, they were very happy. Unfortunately, everybody is not so happy. They could take profit uh, from the cell we call could boost we created in Belgium some years ago. What is it, and what is the advantage? What they liked uh, the most, I would like them to be here with you. The presentation would have been much better, but I would like to be the voice of the user. What they liked uh, mo much are the, collect are the activities, uh, individual and collective activities. And in the collective activities, they liked very much that they are all different. They all have different difficulties, difficult challenges, but uh, they look like another. They have a lot of things to share and common points. And the fact of being in a group. What is important, the concept is uh, to be in the same group uh, during the adventure, which lasts uh, six months. Uh, at the end, uh, and they trust in themselves, and they find an environment uh, which is uh, sure and uh, secure. So the combination with an uh, individual group uh, should exist, because uh, everybody understands that the situation of uh, Pierre is not the same like the situation of Marie or the other ones in the group. So they wanted also to have, they had to have some interviews. And another point which exists in this concept, important for them, when their feedback is asked, is to find a single place which be theirs. So during six months each time, they have a contact with the PEC, it will be at the same place. We shouldn't open another door because it's very difficult to go to a building people don't know or to another place uh, in the city. So they have their own place, uh, they have their group, they have a place, and they know that during six months they will stay like that. So uh, what are the types of activity? I think uh, that uh, now we are going to speak about me Means. But the collective is very important. As we said before, their situation wasn't maybe the uh, case of Pierre and Marie, but I wanted to take uh, real cases. Uh, they are deceived uh, for years and years, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, feeling of 
of deception has increased for them. They don't have a place in the system. This is uh, the way they see themselves. Uh, I am myself. There is a system, and I don't know how I can integrate the system. And all the collective aspect is uh, uh, um, support for them because, uh, yes, I forgot to tell you that they have the same team who uh, is accompanying them during six months. Uh, they have counselors uh, who are always the same. So there is uh, a trust uh, uh, towards this team. They feel uh, very well and uh, they start to share a lot of things. They know that there are some lacks uh, of oral communications or of soft skills. They know it. They are aware, but they have the right to tell it. They are not uh, judged. They know that sometimes they don't have the competences, which are basis competences, writing, reading, and so forth. So there is, we tell them there is a place where you can increase your qualifications for this approach, and you will be stronger. So these elements are important, and there are also contextual elements, and of course, pedagogy is also very important, because the school, the environment they had in school uh, didn't leave her a very a good uh, souvenir. And the methods they have uh, there uh, are methods concerning the collective intelligence. And uh, they trust again in themselves. Uh, they understand that uh, they can learn. They uh, understand that they can uh, also compare themselves to others. This is the collective aspect uh, which Pierre and uh, Marie have always recognized. Of course, there should also be something individual, because at the end, uh, they won't all take uh, have the same profession. So what is important, and I think in the methods, uh, we could share some methods, uh, but uh, at one moment, when they feel at ease, you, uh, we ask them, what do you want to do? Now we are speaking about a job. We organize interviews. We ask questions. Uh, we give them the possibility to go to centers. We work a lot, and uh, we work with uh, local players who open them the doors and to give them the possibility to uh, find a guide for themselves. Uh, so once uh, the uh, professional project has been defined with them, then I can say it is easy. Of course, it's not always very easy. Everybody is not successful, but it is 50% uh, of success. But there are different steps, and all these uh, steps, uh, we, want, we would like that all these steps uh, become a success. So the steps uh, are quite short in order for them to have an accumulation of small uh, successes and uh, not the contrary. So this uh, gives them, again, a feeling of trust towards uh, themselves, uh, and uh, this is also a benefit for them. So here uh, some figures which I would like to share with you. I told you uh, the uh, path, uh, we defined it. Uh, maybe it has something to do with a, a guarantee program. We wanted to make a test after six months. Uh, less than six months uh, is not enough to construct uh, trust, uh, but uh, at a certain time we have to consider also the financial part of the subject, and we think that sometimes that after six months they can fly by their own uh, wings uh, in order to give the possibility to other youngsters to take benefit from this uh, path. We could also choose uh, the following. At the end of six months, uh, we have 50 percent uh, who uh, have a, a positive result.
it, uh, or they uh, they have a training or a job uh, which will be a long-term uh, job. I think that it is quite good because it means that uh, half of them have been relaunched. But what is more interesting is that when you consider them one year after, they are at 70 percent. Uh, that means that uh, all these things uh, need the time. But anyway, we gave them enough cards in order for uh, them uh, to be able uh, to launch themselves. And in all the sites in uh, Belgium, we had uh, two tests. Now we have 10 tests to be more uh, comprehensive from the geographical point of view. And uh, the target is to accompany 50 youngsters per uh, site. That's why we have 500 uh, young, uh, youngsters who are targeted. And uh, you see the young unemployment uh, and the uh, redistribution in the cell boost we had is uh, nearly 50-50%. Uh, the uh, boys are more numerous, but there is a mixing in the group, which also brings us a lot of values. Here you have some feedback from uh, people we worked with, uh, but the feedback I can give you is that uh, Pierre is now following uh, studies of social assistant through the uh, guidance uh, because the service was a very good one. And uh, besides of that, uh, Pierre uh, recognized that he can realize uh, his uh, dream and he could enter the uh, me, but as a civil person. So it's not yet the case, but I wish uh, him uh, to realize his desire. What about Marie? She started, uh, yes, uh, she wanted to become a nurse, as we said at the beginning, uh, things she didn't want, guidance, uh, testing in some uh, training centers, and uh, Marie is now doing something uh, completely different. Uh, So, uh, she is working uh, in... Elle a gagné une double force, j'ai envie de dire. Elle. And uh, she has, uh, she's now much more emancipated, uh, and she feels herself uh, able to go on, even uh, in this uh, field, which is the field of tiling. Uh, she will have an apprenticeship in some weeks, uh, and uh, she is uh, sure that uh, tiling is uh, a uh, job uh, very interesting in Belgium. Thank you. I would like to thank also the organizers, uh, and I would like to answer all questions which come to your mind. Thank you. And Celine also for providing us with these uh, great, great stories of the, um, Marie and Pierre-La. Yeah? Pierre, Pierre. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, uh, well, we have uh, also a short presentation by the Estonian Public Employment Service who unfortunately were not able to attend, uh, which I would like to show now. And then it will be time uh, to discuss a little bit. And uh, like I said, you will be able to also to raise your questions then. Thank you. Greetings. I am Olav Gerdesen, the head of youth policy at the Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund. 13 to 29 year olds are a really important target group for us. Just last year we created our own new strategy which describes who we support, what we do and why we do it. Last year we visited 8th and 9th graders and high schools all over Estonia to offer them career services. We paid miners wage subsidy to employers who employed over 7,500 young workers in the ages of 13 to 16. We also paid my first wage subsidy to employers who employed young people in the ages of 16 to 29 and with little work experience. To reach need youth, we collaborate with local municipalities who have the capability of reaching them through the population registry. 
Every April we hold a digital job and careers fair with job offers, online seminars, individual services, everything online. To conclude, public employment services has a big role to play in supporting people, but we can only get the best results with our partners in cooperation with educational institutions, local municipalities, or even local communities, we get the best results. Therefore, we always have to consider all the labor market actors, include them, and cooperate with them. Okay, um, yes, some kind of round of applause. Uh, this panel is uh, about um, preventing and educating uh, young persons, so um, I would like uh, to kick off uh, the conversation a little bit, and I'm sure you have some questions, and um, there will be somebody moving around with a microphone to raise your questions, so you can raise your hands, but um, I just would like to, to start um, to ask um, to Christina from Croatia a question. Um, since you talked about your career guidance centers promoting lifelong learning, not only to young people, but also to citizens of all ages, uh, maybe you can share like a real life example of how these centers uh, have positively impacted on individuals' career choices or helped someone to prevent to become a need. Well, I can give you more than one example, but I will focus on uh, one example that I know of. Uh, when we said that everybody can go to this lifelong career guidance center, usually those are children or pupils and their parents. And uh, the uh, desires of parents and youth are usually not uh, in sync. So uh, then our counselors there talk with both and child and the, uh, and the parent what kind of further education would be most appropriate based on, on, on the needs uh, or on the abilities of, of that uh, child. And then uh, together they combine, uh, I would say, uh, an opinion uh, to where to go further on. The other opinion is uh, not that uh, career guidance, everybody can come. Em uh, uh, employed person can also come there. So uh, th we also have people uh, in uh, certain occupations they would like to change. Uh, uh, change completely occupation or, or area, uh, so, but they're not sure in which direction it should go, they should go. So uh, they can come there, fulfill the questionnaire, if they really want to, uh, they can talk with the career uh, guidance counselors, and I'm talking about those career guidance counselors, I say colleges mostly. So uh, they, they're really experienced in, in going in depth in the conversation uh, with people, and then they uh, point the person in which direction it should be the, the most appropriate, and then uh, they can apply to us, although they are uh, employed uh, uh, people, uh, to give them, for example, voucher for upskilling in uh, or digital or at the moment digital or green, but uh, in in the near future, all different uh, occupations are going to through that system. So uh, this is, let's say, two examples uh, of, of how those career guidance centers work. Thank you. Um, also, I have a question uh, for Christina from the European Training Foundation, since um, you talked about also the youth guarantee in the Western Balkans, um, and which is very interesting, I thought, yeah, but because it represents also countries that are not involved in the European Union and um, might have different concepts, different fundings, and uh, you talked about partnership-based approach and political commitment. Maybe you can share an example with us how these collaborations and commitments have made a difference difference in prevention of need status and supporting the region's youth. Uh, thank you for the question, yeah. I mean, when I mentioned... Merci pour la 
commitment, the youth guarantee work in the Western Balkans is based on uh, uh, high level commitment but also partnership based commitment because countries were invited to establish working groups, commissions uh, uh, that would develop together the, in the implementation plan for the, for the youth guarantee. Uh, so um, uh, a partnership uh, combi uh, comprising ministries of labor, ministries of education, ministries in charge with youth policies, uh, social partners, youth organizations, statistical offices, uh, um, even representatives of the municipalities or territorial uh, associations and so on. So uh, this is the first element and it ensures, uh, um, let's say, a holistic approach to different problematics. Uh, of course, under public employment service here or qualification agencies and so on. Uh, maybe with, uh, you know, focus on what you, you asked me, in, you know, with some concrete, uh, con uh, concrete uh, um, example, I would maybe mention also some reforms in the area of uh, uh, dual education where we see that work-based learning opportunities which are really a key element to prevent becoming need or, at, or helping if a person, a young person becomes unemployment or unemployed or inactive. Uh, we have these dual education uh, reforms, for example, in Serbia or in Montenegro, but practically I would see that everywhere in the Western Balkans is more or less the same partnership uh, arrangements where you have the ministries uh, uh, partnering with companies, with uh, employers associations, chambers of commerce, and uh, putting together resources, be it national, be it also private, be it also EU, um, or other donors, uh, and uh, providing such, uh, such opportunities to, to young uh, people. And I'm really glad to see that it's not only an ad hoc uh, project based intervention, we see now that there is a policy approach based on that, I mean, um, and going back to what you said, you know, the reference to, to career guidance, I think also here it's important to, to work in partnership because the technological advancement changes the way career guidance, information, uh, labor market information, um, management and, you know, dissemination changes the way career guidance services should be de are de delivered. So there, uh, there is a need and we saw in practice examples of technological, let's say uh, technology based co companies collaborating with the ministries of labor or public employment services to design uh, uh, platforms information platforms for, for, for youngsters and and so on. yeah so it's really about um, collaborating with different collaborators uh, it on all the levels. Yeah, it's a multi-level, multi-partnership, multi-type, and maybe this is also maybe a difficulty sometimes also from legislation perspective or even funding perspective because you have multiple types of organizations, private, uh, uh, public, uh, non-for-profit, non-for-profit, uh, yeah, non-profit and, and so on, and sometimes it's rather, uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, also for our community, European Union community, this is a, a challenge and we need to, to take it into account, the, this variety of formats of delivery of partnerships and, and so on. And most importantly, to involve youth organizations in the, the design of uh, and monitoring of these reforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, moving to the perspective of Belgium, Le Forum, um, talked about small successes, the concept of a single team, single place is very, very fascinating. So how does this approach cater to individuals with no clear or realistic professional project and how has it helped in addressing need status? Um, but I, I think that place, so it's it's not a place like they, um, they mentioned before where you can just come and, and open the door and you'll have something. That's We have that kind of stuff too, but that's another concept. Here, it's, it, it, it really becomes their place, actually. It, it, it becomes their, I'm not going to say their house or their home, but there is kind of that feeling there where they... Um, but they, they, they know where they are, they, they are the only one who's going to be there, and I, I just think that creates this, um, this atmosphere, this trust um, uh, environment that, that just helps 
to um, to admit what's hard to admit sometimes, to share some stuff that are difficult to share, to uh, and then when you go over that point, then to start to look for solution. But first, they need to. Um, to see where there is difficult, they need to admit there is a difficulties and they need to want to change. They also say it, it's like at one point we give them tools, cards, but that needs to come from there, that needs to come from them. Otherwise it's, well, it's going to happen maybe a few weeks or a month, but then it's, it's not going to be on the long term. So, uh, so I think that, yeah, that, and we made it also that place uh, known um, because I'm, I'm going to say when they cross the door and they accept to do it, it's also, well, this is also, I don't know, 30, 40 percent that, that, that's done, the, the job is done. The hardest is, of course, to know where are they, these people, and how do you, how do you, how do you reach them? Because you know there are tons of them, much more than what the data show. Um, so that, again, that's like social working. It's just... It's like, like a little bee that just go everywhere and try to put whatever needs to be done. So that, that, that could be a poster, that could be a mailing, that could be some contacts, that could be, you need to multiply um, the different uh, support, action, and relationship. Because if they, voila, Pierre, he just, how did he got there, Pierre? And Pierre, he got there because he is actually registered, because in Belgium this is compulsory, because we work with social services to make sure that even if they are not really unemployed, they are needs, but they are registered, registered, which between us, I think it's a very good thing because then you have a, a real view of what happened. The bad side of it, I can tell you, the Ministry of Unemployment is not happy about that because in once, then you have the quantity of unemployed people that is going to rise. But, but I mean, this is just facing the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pierre, but we send sometimes emailings, and then don't ask me why, and I could ask him and tell you if you want, but at one point that mailing, he read it, and he, what was written in it, he just, he just said, okay, I'm gonna try. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was the mailing. But I know, um, I think 25%, that's also worth of mouth. So one, because, uh, they kind of gather these, the, the, these young people in difficulties in some other places and when they see one that actually integrated something like this or something else, then they share it and that, that becomes maybe also possible and that, well, that, that becomes to, uh, to be maybe something they can consider. And then if you at the right time with an email, a poster, or well, a phone number, whatever, you have more chances to be able to grab them. Yes, and I think uh, what you said, um, when something becomes mandatory, it's, uh, we all know that it might be you know, not fun because it's not coming from our own motivation and then to build the trust with the young people, that is really the, the hard thing to do, I guess, so, yeah. Well, um, I would love uh, to, to, to see if you have some questions within the audience. Please raise your hand. Uh, we have uh, somebody coming around with the microphone and uh, we have these great speakers here that would love to answer your questions and open up the discussion. We have one question over there. Good morning again. I have two questions for Madame Ansi. During your presentation, you spoke about social counselors and about counselors in the professional training, but you didn't speak about counselors in employment. Did you use them during this experience? The second question, I would really know what uh, are the means uh, you had in order to keep these uh, youngsters, uh, to keep them such a long time, because they have a difficult uh, age and uh, they are needs. Thank you for the question. Uh, how to keep them? Maybe the most important is uh, that we are uh, very transparent with them. We don't accept everybody. It is on a voluntary basis. We uh, explain them uh, clearly the path they have to go through. They know that it will be collective, it will be individual, that it will last uh, uh, for six months. And generally speaking, uh, 
when you explain them everything from the beginning, we can be deceived uh, at a certain time because we see that uh, there are less and less people at the end, but we should do it like that because uh, in this, uh, uh, when we behave like that, uh, we have less uh, dropouts. So the selection should be done at the beginning to feel the potential. Of course, it's complicated because we feel that there are some people who are there and who are not going to take benefit from this path. But if we don't uh, see the uh, potential, we are going to lose them anyway. So we try to push them towards other structures, but we help them to finish the path with the others. And I forgot your quest, or your first question. Can you repeat it? The counselor in uh, employment uh, in the cell itself, uh, it's not their uh, specialty to be a counselor in this field, uh, but uh, during the six months, uh, there is a time they have to spend, uh, so there are other steps. Uh, and uh, uh, the role of this counselor comes uh, very late because the most difficult is to listen to them, to define their professional projects, uh, and to deal with some financial difficulties or psychological, social difficulties. So they have these counselors, employment counselors, who can come and intervene punctually for uh, one or two working group, but they are not a part uh, of uh, uh, the core. I hope that I answered your question. We have one question here. There's one question here. Ayang. Uh, My question is to Christina Fletcher. During your intervention, you said that uh, one of the difficulties is to find where needs are and how we can go and approach them. Can you give us some concrete examples of actions who, which can help us to find the needs and to, to help them? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a difficult question. Uh, uh, we, the problem with the inactive needs, we don't have a problem with unemployed uh, young. We know who they are, but who are the inactive? So, uh, We didn't know where they are, what kind of background they have, what uh, kind of education they have. So we um, had a partnership agreement with the uh, schools, uh, secondary and tertiary education, uh, with the uh, registry of employed people and our register of unemployed. Uh, and then when we map Uh, all those people, uh, the ones who are not either unemployed or uh, employed, those were the needs. Uh, because of, uh, of GDPR, we didn't know their names, but we knew uh, about the statistical data, the structure, where they are, uh, in, uh, uh, local, in what local office they belong to, and then uh, we had an activities. We couldn't We don't have uh, youth ambassadors. Uh, we couldn't come to their homes. Uh, but we organized different actions on that, on that local level. So if they are living in a municipality where there are 3,000 people in total, uh, and you announce that we are going to do some, uh, I don't know, gaming issue, gaming, uh, contestant, then they will come. So actually, they, we cooperated on, uh, on, the, on, uh, on that level with the uh, schools. 
because they could provide us with uh, additional information. Uh, or the schools had uh, um, open day of schools or um, inviting all, all students uh, uh, to a gathering. So then we uh, came there. But I have to say, those are just very, very brief uh, moments. We don't have that nationwide. Uh, uh, it depends on the local community uh, and it depends on the data. Uh, now we, we want to upgrade uh, uh, everything and now we, have, we, we are going into another partnership agreement uh, where we have more information. As I said, uh, we are lacking 100,000 people, uh, and we know that a, a lot of youth went outside Croatia, and they didn't deregister from um, uh, from our health insurance and so on. So, uh, officially they are in Croatia, and unofficially they are not. So we have to track them more, more in depth to see that we don't go into into actions which are costly actions uh, in vain. Merci. Thank you. I am coming from Morocco, from an EPEC. Thank you for your intervention. I would like to share a reflection and then ask a question. A small reflection. Yes, it is true that uh, there is a difficulty because uh, uh, the counselor of employment is not ready. So we have uh, to work always with partners in the case of partnership. So the difficulty is uh, to be sure that we have uh, uh, permanent partnerships which will last because there are always uh, financing uh, problems uh, and uh, for a project we need uh, partners, associations, organizations and so forth and uh, everything we, uh, should be financed. Uh, so here uh, I don't know if we can make an innovation in this field and imagine other concepts in order to be sure that uh, this uh, system uh, will last uh, for a long while because it is a phenomenon which uh, might become worse with the crisis we are living every day. Coming to the question of protection of rights uh, of uh, personal data, it is a question which hasn't been addressed, uh, but I wanted to know how you can protect uh, the personal data, but because there is also a, a partnership uh, between institutions and the uh, uh, private sector. I don't know to whom I have to ask a question, but still. Uh, I think this uh, goes to the public employment service. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your reflection. Yes, this is the most uh, challenging what we see also, this uh, durability of the partnerships and cooperation and so on, because uh, as you said, it's a youth guarantee, but you know, working with need, but as you said, the new world and the change, it changes a lot the way public employment services uh, implement activities, and we don't talk anymore about outsourcing and or classical partnerships. And but uh, from my experience, it, uh, the solution has to be, uh, uh, you know, sought in the context of each uh, country, uh, because there are specific legislation provisions, uh, you know, conditionalities, uh, and so on. There is a lot of innovation, uh, and I uh, uh, invite you. Maybe to look at uh, certain EU member states have uh, devised, uh, you know, more flexible arrangements for a kind of a partnership. But uh, once again, I want to underline this quality element, and I think you mentioned as well, uh, not.
not anyone can provide uh, uh, employment or counseling or social services. Uh, uh, so it has to be agreed. All partners should abide to the same, uh, 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 you know, elements of uh, of quality uh, uh, assurance. Uh, and most importantly, this is the most. I, I think that's the bottleneck and the big obstacle in youth guarantee implementation across Europe. I would say, and in Western Balkans, we will see uh, soon is this GDPR. You know data protection, because for a successful uh, implementation data, there should be an interoperability of different databases. And as you said, you have multiple players, not only the public employment services. So to give an example, I don't know if colleagues from Portugal are here, but uh, years ago, then, when they designed the youth guarantee and this interoperability of databases, they wanted to see the public employment service to see in advance the, those children, those pupils, that are prone to dropping out. So to see years in advance if there are risks from, uh, you know, from uh, upper secondary education uh, and to intervene rapidly. And I remember they explained to us how complicated it was to reach an agreement to exchange data between the Ministry of Education or let's say the education sector and the labor, uh, uh, labor sector. And moreover, to have also the consent of parents because at that point in time this was were minors, this, uh, yeah. so it's complicated but not, uh, not impossible uh, to do. Again, there are significant regulations involved and they have to be, uh, but it's not impossible, this is what I can tell you. There are solutions and uh, yeah, my plea is also to look at the uh, Croatian example and other, uh, other countries. <clears throat> Well, I can share our experience about the data protection and exchange of data between institutions. Uh, if you have in your law uh, with which uh, public employment service uh, uh, is um, guided, and if you stipulate what kind of data for which purpose you, uh, you collect, then you are the owner of those data. And uh, for each institution, if, it, if it's uh, the same for each institution, then within the institutions you have to have a partnership agreement on uh, the data which are going to be exchanged uh, with which purpose. Uh, we regulated that and I can't say that we have any problems with data exchange. Those are, those are not data that are going to be publicly shared. Those are the data for the analysis, uh, for, uh, I would say, mapping needs or, or uh, so on. Uh, maybe I can uh, share my experience about, uh, you, ask, uh, you, you have your um, uh, experience with the partnership about training the uh, counselors, if I understood you well. Uh, what we did, we had our uh, we designed our own training center. Uh, it was years ago. We had the partnership agreement. Uh, it was financed through uh, um, uh, EU funds. Uh, we have a group of 15 people trained to be a trainer, uh, and it was 2000 and, in 2002 uh, when we had our trainers. We have a group of trainers who train all the others. So basically, from 2005 or six, I'm not sure about the year, uh, we stipulated for all counselors, newly employed counselors, they have to go through three basic trainings. And they cannot start work as a counselors uh, without those trainings. Uh, then they have a mentoring with a uh, more experienced counselor and uh, throughout the, their work they have different types of in-house trainings that they, can, uh, that they can go through because they are being designed every day. But uh, in between uh, our training center had a partnership with other, other training centers, with other partners, which provided us with the, with the knowledge of different types of training. So basically, we were dealing, we are dealing with a training, a counselor training on our own.
Are there any other questions? We still have some time and would be happy to answer your questions. No, um, um, I have a question uh, for you, uh, Christina from Croatia. Oh, I, I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. the microphone not working or no no is there a question I can't see it from here no okay uh, I want to, I really want you to give the opportunity to ask questions so if there are any questions please raise your hand um, yes like I said I really have a question that is really interesting to me because uh, Christina um, from Croatia, um, and you talked about long-term unemployed youth. I think this is something that is uh, really coming up now, and it, I think it's not used quite often now since we talk about either long-term unemployed or young people uh, not in employment or education. So I'm um, just really interested because, as you said, it's really also a high number, 40% uh, of the young persons registered within your institution, as I understood. So. <clears throat> I was just interested how you identify and how you collect the data or which what are the requirements to well for for all uh, unemployed uh, and um, if you if you uh, take up uh, EU funds, uh, then there is a, a differentiate between long-term unemployment between people uh, young, 15 to 24. Uh, it is six months. Uh, after six months, they become long-term unemployed, and after uh, and for uh, 25 up, they are after 12 months. Uh, and th this is this is uh, the type of um, uh, definition that we use for a long-term unemployment with the youth. Uh, so basically, th that is uh, that is why it's the larger number. If we if we look uh, look uh, on everybody, uh, 12 months and more, then the, the number of long-term youth would be uh, much uh, much smaller. But that is an issue. Uh, and uh, since they are youth. Uh, they need to, I, I can say, provide for the society, uh, for the future. Uh, we cannot uh, allow them to stay uh, long-term unemployed if there is no reason. If there is no. Uh, reason for them to stay. Of course, there are different types of subgroups uh, that you cannot prevent uh, them becoming a long-term unemployed, but still, in that uh, basin of, 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 of that pool of um, uh, young long-term unemployed, there are still uh, young, uh, youth who are employable, but we have to see with each of uh, each of them what to do. Some, they are in rural areas, they don't have opportunities, neither for education Education, neither for employment, uh, neither uh, for support because the transportation is uh, costly and so on. So we have to provide them uh, with some sort of, uh, of tools to go into, into the labor market. Uh, in other areas, uh, there are just stop searching for a job or uh, uh, recently we have more and more uh, people uh, becoming long-term unemployed uh, when we ask them why are you registered at the employment service because my mom and dad said so they're not want to uh, seek for a job they don't have any interest uh, in upskilling so but you have to do something you have to i would say motivate them just to do something with their self because uh, while the uh, time passes they lose skills they look uh, they lose motivation uh, they lose um, touch with the reality so 
we, a lot of motivational counseling uh, we are doing, uh, career guidance, but the part of career guidance when, we, uh, when they talk with the psychologists because they are psychology, uh, psychological testing and so on, because you have to move them. It is very costly, it is a very slow process, uh, but we have to do something. Because we are, uh, we we don't need, uh, we don't have enough uh, labor force, and they are becoming smaller and smaller, and we cannot just let them uh, let them stay unemployed. Uh, if I can also complement uh, the Croatian experience with uh, what I see in the commitments of the Western Balkan countries um, is to use also for this in this critical phase, you also ask about this identification. So outreaching phase uh, uh, when it comes to working with uh, need is uh, to use also the representatives of the youth organizations or representatives of these vulnerable uh, communities uh, because this peer-to-peer -peer exchange uh, and uh, is more convincing than uh, just a uh, or only a classical approach with registration and so on. So the very first step is also to uh, to to have this partnership uh, with uh, uh, representatives and young people, particularly because they are more or less more convincing. So for this reason, uh, in the Western Balkans, but not only other EU member states uh, have also employed the same strategy to also have trainings, capacity buildings, uh, building for uh, youth organizations organizations, youth workers, to understand what it means youth guarantee, what are the, the processes, the programs, the opportunities, and to explain uh, uh, well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? No? I was quite impatient because I had a lot of questions. I would like to ask a question for Salience uh, on the program that you just mentioned. What were the difficulties that you faced, especially when it comes to implementing this program, and what would be the things that uh, could be improved for you? Lots of difficulties, lots of challenges. Why? Well, because uh, just like we said, it is a partnership project, so we needed to find the good um, stakeholders, the good actors who would contribute to what we, will, we wanted to do. And of course, um, human capital, human resources, etc. These are also topics that can create difficulties. Not always, but from time to time, we need to find the right people so that we can uh, get the, the support that we need. And we can uh, give the support to people who need it. Especially while, lands, uh, while launching the pilot project, I mean, uh, we, we had some idea, yes, but when it comes to realizing that, it, it doesn't always go as it's supposed to be because we cannot always consider the details. And uh, another difficulty that we are still facing today is that even though this is a concept, this is like a concept, we still have to define it. We, we need to have maybe six months, and it, it consists of six people. There's a group, and we need to find the right way to deploy them, and at the same time, it can get really frustrating from time to time, especially to being obligated to respect uh, all of these, even though whatever the consultants are saying, working with some type of people is quite hard. Yes, we say yes to some people, but there are other five, 15 people that are waiting, so we need to find the right balance in order to, to well manage it. Otherwise, we can also lose our sufficiency, if I may say, our efficiency. And this is why we need to acknowledge that we have to share lots of things with people, with our colleagues, and uh, we need to keep in mind that these people will also share everything with their colleagues, so we need to be 
able to listen to them and we need to inform them that there are other people that will come for our uh, consultancy. We don't want to scare them either because these are we want to continue to work with all of them. We want these projects to continue. And then sometimes we have to interrupt. We have other projects that are in line. Um, in, uh, there are lots of other difficulties. Uh, the choice of uh, tools that we are going to use, uh, how we can facilitate the, the obstacles that we are facing, how we can overcome them, etc. Lots of things. Okay, we have time for one more question and then um, I would like to announce the break since we need to stick a little bit to the schedule. Um, but uh, however, uh, all our uh, panelists today here will be around also um, the whole day and tomorrow so you can also go ahead and ask other questions. So I have a question here, please sir. Merci beaucoup, madame. Et... Thank you, madam. My question is uh, for Celine. You talked about the boost project at a national level, and if it's national, just like you said, it should be a collective project that should be individual, if I understood you correctly. So, who are the beneficiaries and who decides on the beneficiaries uh, that will be on an individual level? What are the fundamental criteria while deciding. You said that not everybody can uh, benefit from this project. So what are the criteria? What is the foundational, uh, um, fundamental criteria while deciding who will benefit from this particular project? Thank you. Yes, we tested this project, I think it was two or three years ago, and uh, afterwards uh, we had a larger region and we also had a, a higher responsibility in terms of uh, PES. Just like I said, we had two sites that had been tested and we created a model to see if we can use this model on other sites, on other regions. And then we had the question, why six months? Why not shorter? Why not longer? I mean, it's, it was like a baby and you have to accept the baby as they come. And afterwards, you can do whatever you can to evolve it. So we had a uniform concept. Excuse, uh, excuse me, I keep forgetting the other questions. So, this program in fact combines collective and individual. It's not that we are choosing the people. It's We are bringing them together. This is a, an inclusive program. There are some individual moments, there are some collective moments, and uh, the collective moments are mainly collective, let's say, in the beginning, and uh, for the individual ones we are trying to get organized with our uh, human resources etc so we need to see if a person that we are going to work with needs a second uh, interview we, we try to combine both of them you know and you had a you had a third question yes criteria selection criteria sorry so so far I'm not sure if it's a, if we are lucky or not, but we didn't have any. Let me explain. We have a capacity of accepting a group of uh, 10 or maybe 15 people. And when it comes to informing them, just like I said previously, we are talking about uh, engaging them. And it happens naturally. And uh, norm uh, normally we have uh, people, just like I said, between 10 to 15. We don't want to go with the criteria for selecting people. We didn't, uh, we didn't um, make to appeal people, if I may say, because we have lots of people who can benefit from our services, but we don't have that selection criteria, just like you mentioned yet. Thank you so much uh, for all your
insightful questions and also to the panelists. I think uh, one of the main challenges is also still um, staff and resources, as I'm understanding, and um, sharing and outreaching is also a very, very big topic, um, but that will be more for tomorrow. We'll have also a panel discussion tomorrow on outreach, uh, which will be very interesting, um, how to collaborate with other partners. Um, Yes, uh, I think this completes uh, our today's uh, panel, the first part at least. Uh, um, I would like to announce now the coffee break. Uh, we will be um, gathering here at 3.45 and then we'll have the second part and also a presentation of ILO Turkey and uh, Ishko Turkey. Thank you so much uh, for participating and see you later.